I'm delighted to be with you all again. I'm so grateful to Margareta and her team and the program for having me join you for National Family Caregiver Month. Um, in addition to all the ways that uh, Margareta, you so generously introduced me. Um, as I said last time, I feel like it's really important um, to say that uh, I am a family caregiver myself. Um, I have been a volunteer caregiver. Uh, that's how I first came to my work with um, the Zen Caregiving Project. Um, and these principles and practices that I'm going to share with you today are, I use them, I depend on them, I trust them. Um, so it's really my joy to kind of share them with you and invite you to join me in uh, benefiting from them. Yeah, so great to be with you. Um, huh. So I want to just look back briefly at last time. So a quick review if you were with us or just a little overview if you weren't able to be here. Um, and this lovely title, um, Compassion in Your Pocket, Self-Compassion Strategies Anytime, Anywhere. So when Margareta and I were first talking about what we wanted these webinars to contain and to look like, um, I thought of the late Zen master and teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, but this idea of compassion right there in your pocket, meaning that it's always available. It's accessible. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't require special circumstances or esoteric knowledge that it's something um, really simple and human, and it's always available to us. So um, this idea of it being in your pocket, it's portable, it's always with us. Um, and something that we did last week, also inspired by the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, was a little bit of uh, breathing in, breathing out, which we're doing all the time anyway, but breathing in for ourselves, and breathing out for others. So this weaving together of the compassion that we offer to others as caregivers, as caring human beings, and that we just include ourselves in our compassion um, and we breathe in for ourselves, breathe out for others. So just using the very simple um, life-giving and automatic process of our body as a way to remind us and even guide us uh, in our compassion practice. Um, we talked a little bit about the benefits of self-compassion and some of the myths of self-compassion. We did uh, self-compassion break practice, which contained, if you were here last time you remember, um, these pretty simple concepts of mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. And then we had some time to discuss and share. So that was last time. Today, um, we'll talk a little bit about the essence of self-compassion. Um, we'll take a brief look at what Kristen Neff whose research we're drawing from um, refers to as fierce self-compassion. And we'll go return to some of these myths of self-compassion and go a little more deeply into what some self-compassion is not. Um, I think we can have ideas and some ways that we resist self-compassion or don't trust it or feel like we don't deserve it or there are various ways that it can make us a little uncomfortable that's completely natural, even if it's misguided. So I'll talk about that. Uh, we'll do a practice together, self-compassion practice that involves uh, some supportive touch. We'll talk about the benefits of that. Uh, a chime to uh, share together, hopefully in small breakout groups, and then back together in the big group before we close. So a lot, but I think there'll be time for all of it. 
So the essence of self-compassion, yeah, can be expressed in this simple question, what do I need right now? Yeah, just this simple question, what do I need right now? So whether like me and like some of us here, self-compassion is familiar, we know a little bit about it, maybe we even practice it, or if it's brand new, it's worth keeping in mind that self-compassion is really a practice of goodwill that we're expressing towards ourselves more than just feeling good and not suffering. So another way maybe to say that is that even though this friendly, supportive stance of self-compassion is aimed at soothing and alleviating our suffering, um, we can't always control the way things are. <laughs> we can't always stop the circumstances or the conditions that contribute to our suffering. And as caregivers, wow, we know this really well, right? Things just are not always in our control. Um, but we can respond to suffering in a kind and supportive way, even if we can't stop it from occurring. So self-compassion practice is not, it's aimed at alleviating our suffering, but we're not using it to try to suppress our suffering or even deny our suffering. That generally doesn't work ultimately. And maybe we all can uh, think of the truth of that in our own lives, times when we've tried to just suppress or deny or stuff down difficult feelings and experiences. Um, it's either not possible or it doesn't work in the long run, it kind of backfires. But with self-compassion, we're accepting mindfully that a moment is painful and we embrace ourselves with kindness and care in response, remembering that this is part of a shared human experience. Yeah, not being able to control things being imperfect, things being difficult, things even being painful is part of a shared human experience. And that allows us to really hold ourselves in this loving way, this connected way and give ourselves support and comfort that we need to be with the pain, to bear the burden of our suffering while providing um, conditions to continue to grow and even transform. Yeah, so lots of benefits to self-compassion, all stemming from the seed of this essential question, what do I need right now? So then um, turning to the difference between tender and fierce self-compassion. So this slide looks remarkably different from the other ones. This is a resource from Kristen Neff and she makes these available in her work and on her website. So I borrowed this from her with permission and I just wanted uh, you all to look at it uh, to get a sense of these two kind of flavors. So we have the tender self-compassion that we were just talking about being with ourselves in an accepting way comforting ourselves, reassuring ourselves that we're not alone, and just being present with our pain in, um, in an open-hearted way. Um, but also really interesting to look at fierce self-compassion. So that kind of mama bear, right, that we see on the one side of the slide there, um, that's very protective and uh, can even inspire us to act in the world, whether it's advocating, protecting our loved ones, or further out if we're acting for um, to change systems, maybe so it's healthier and more just for everyone who needs care and needs protection, this kind of thing, uh, involving boundaries, um, all of these different ways that we can express self-compassion 
in um, a more fierce, I love the figure that's kind of standing, you know, in a power stance with the superhero cape. So these two sides, if you will, um, of self-compassion, and it doesn't have to be one or the other, they can be expressed at the same time. They're both within us, circumstances, our own mood, our own capacity might determine which one comes to the fore or which one we enter into at a given time. And I just wanted to give you a little flavor, yeah, of this tender and fierce self-compassion. So then looking at what self-compassion is not. So if you were with us two weeks ago, I touched just pretty quickly on some of the myths of self-compassion, some fears around it, some reasons that we might feel resistant um, or uncertain about if we deserve self-compassion um, or if it's okay to express it to ourselves. So let me go into a couple of these, three of them in depth. The first is self-pity. So self-compassion is not the same thing as self-pity. Um, self-pity is often linked with kind of self-isolation. So for caregivers, you know, while it's true that we're often alone while we're in the role, even as we're caring kind of on our own, we might be the only one with a lot of responsibilities, we can still remember that we're connected to others and to the world. So we might be struggling, we might even be suffering, but with self-compassion, we remember that other things like beauty and meaning and joy can be present also, right? And I think if we take a moment and just reflect on our own real life experience, we know that this is true. Yeah, some of that poignancy really um, of sadness and joy being present at the same time. So self-pity, more of a narrow perspective, self-compassion taking a broader perspective. Yeah. So another thing that self-compassion is not is self-indulgence. This is a kind of a common fear, the idea that um, if I'm being compassionate to myself, I'm just kind of letting myself off the hook, or maybe I'm lowering my standards, you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want to or whatever I need to, to not be in pain. Um, and so in that way, self-indulgence, more a practice or a habit of responding to our suffering by wanting to numb it or escape it. So not to say that we have to suffer all the time or that pleasure and respite aren't vitally important because we know that they are. It's not that suffering is good, but how we respond to our suffering, how we help to soothe and alleviate it um, really makes all the difference, right? So that when we're being compassionate to ourselves, we want to be happy and healthy in the long term in the moment, but also in the long term. So just as an example, um, the self-indulgence of say, like uh, a professional massage, if that's something that appeals to you, or a meal out at your favorite restaurant when you're able to do that might be one way to um, indulge and care for yourself, but not the same thing as consistently maybe spending beyond your means or, you know, eating a gallon of ice cream by yourself every single night, right? That might be useful and enjoyable in some way in the moment, but in the long term, not going to support your overall health and well-being. So with self-compassion, we can even recognize our weaknesses um, but we do that with kindness rather than with self-shaming. And then finally, self-compassion is not the same thing as self-esteem, right? They're often seen as similar, uh, but there are some really important differences. So let me describe those for a moment. 
Um, self-esteem, really referring to our sense of self-worth, our perceived value, how much we like ourselves. And while low self-esteem is shown to be linked to possibly depression or a lack of motivation, trying to have just higher self-esteem can also be problematic. So in our culture, generally, self-esteem is based on how much we're different from others, right? How much we stand out, how special we are. And again, Kristen Neff, who does so much research and work on self-compassion, points out that all of that can lead us to feel like we have to be above average just to feel good about ourselves. So it's this comparing ourselves to others in order to feel good. Yeah. So if we're attempting to raise our self-esteem, we might become self-absorbed, less aware of others and their needs, and even kind of need to think less of others in order to feel better about ourselves. All of that, some of the pitfalls of just trying to increase our self-esteem. Um, but in contrast to all of that, self-compassion is not based on self-evaluation. We give ourselves compassion not because we're special and good and better than other people, but because all human beings deserve compassion and understanding. And so with self-compassion, we don't have to feel better than someone else in order to be kind to ourselves, right? We're kind to ourselves simply because we're humans, all humans suffer and we all deserve to feel less suffering if we can and to hold our suffering with care yeah, as much as we can. And finally, just a note about some of the research that in comparison to self-esteem, it's self-compassion that's really associated with greater emotional resilience, more accurate self-concepts, and more caring behavior in relationships. So for caregivers, a real bonus there. Yeah, more caring behavior in relationships. All right. So now let me set us up for a little bit of self-compassion practice. And what I want to offer today is some supportive touch practice. And first, just a little bit about how good this is for us, right? So supporting our care system, our parasympathetic nervous system. I know the UCSF team knows this very well about the benefits of physical touch, this um, hormone of oxytocin that's associated with feeling safe, increased empathy, feeling warm and connected, providing a sense of security, soothing, distressing emotions, calming even physiological, cardiovascular stress. So lots of benefits from touch. Um, not all of us feel comfortable, maybe even with the idea of self-touch. And it may feel awkward or sound awkward. And um, this third point on this slide, I love. And so I want to just speak to that directly, that while in our mind, right, we might have a sense of, oh, that's going to feel weird or look weird, or there's an association from our past about touching our own body that might bring up some discomfort and not to discount those real experiences, but just to remember that our body doesn't know the difference, right? Just the way we receive benefit from the soothing, safe touch of another person, we can offer it to ourselves. And through that incredibly sensitive organ of the skin that covers the whole body, we will receive the benefit. So just thinking of 
that beautiful image of a baby that is being cuddled and soothed in the arms of a safe mother or caregiver. Yeah, we can give ourselves all of that benefit. So if you are willing, um, we'll try that a little bit together now and I'll guide us through and give you some suggestions and instructions. Um, but I wanna say at the outset that you have absolute choice and I hope that you'll give it a try and follow along. But of course, if it doesn't feel right for you or safe for you or you're not interested in doing it, by all means, take care of yourself and maybe just listen and try it another time um, when, whenever you wish to, okay? So the first thing I'd like to do is just um, invite us to kind of turn inward, just sort of settle into the body a little bit since I've been talking for a while and you all have been using your brains to receive and integrate a lot of information, both visually and orally. So let's just connect with our bodies for a moment. If you would like to close your eyes, please feel free to do so. You can certainly leave them open if you prefer, maybe just cast your gaze downward. And let's just connect with the physical body wherever you are right now just feeling where you're seated or standing or lying down and just become aware of your breath no need to change it but just feel into the movement of the breath in your body right now. Just notice that you're breathing. Maybe there's one place in your body where it feels easiest to be aware of the movement of the breath. So maybe the belly or the chest or the nostrils. And just let yourself kind of follow the cycle of breath fully, all the way from the beginning of an inhalation as the air comes in, moves into the lungs. Maybe you can sense it all the way down to the belly. And then as you exhale, same thing, the belly kind of settles back down. The chest falls gently. The air leaves the body through the nostrils. So just noticing, just feeling the movement of the breath. And if you like, as we prepare to try some supportive touch, you might connect with that essential question of self-compassion. What do I need right now? And there might be an answer, but there doesn't have to be an answer. Just kind of moving into that space of recognizing that we are full human beings and it matters that our needs are recognized and addressed. So the first supportive touch to try is that just hand on your heart. So gently placing a hand over your heart it's a gesture of support and kindness, maybe even a gesture of inquiry. What do I need right now? Feeling a gentle pressure 
and warmth of your hand. If you wish, you could place both hands on your chest, maybe just experimenting with the difference of having one hand there and bringing a second hand on top. Just taking a breath or two. You can express supportive touch by making a small circle with your hand on your chest. Just very light, small circular motion. As you do this, maybe you continue to feel the natural rising and falling of your chest as you're breathing in and breathing out. You might try padding gently patting the hand on the chest. Just suggestions. If something sounds like you want to try it, please do. Otherwise, just stick with what feels appropriate for you right now. It's slow and gentle. I want to offer a couple other possibilities. You can try placing a hand on your cheek. Just gently a hand on your cheek. You can feel my hand feels a little cool compared to my face. But that can be a tender and supportive gesture. You can try cradling your face in your hands. So a hand on either side, just breathing there. You can leave the hands there if you wish, or you might try gently stroking the arms. Could be the full length of the arm. I find that my forearms really like and respond to a gentle stroke. And if it feels right for you, just staying in contact with this question, what do I need right now? Another way to express supportive touch is what they sometimes call giving yourself a hug. So just crossing your arms in front of your chest and giving yourself a gentle squeeze, maybe the shoulders or the upper arms, just gently feeling that kind of safe embrace. Again, rubbing or patting wherever the hands are. All of these simple gestures really speak to our nervous system in a deep way of safety, of comfort, soothing. A couple other ways to try hand on the abdomen that can feel grounding and soothing right around the belly button or just below one hand or two hands breathing
Sometimes supportive touch can be just holding your own hand. So cupping one hand in the other in your lap, not involving other parts of the body, just cupping one hand in the other. You might try one hand as the bottom cupping hand, holding the other, and then maybe alternate. And then maybe lastly, um, has the sweet name of the butterfly hug. So again, kind of arms crossed over your chest, but the fingers, yeah, are just gonna flutter or tap very lightly at the shoulders. They can maybe move up onto the neck. They could even reach over the shoulders to the back, if you can reach there comfortably. But that little fluttering, the butterfly wings, just gentle stimulation, gentle tapping of the fingers as your arms are crossed over your chest. So just exploring whatever of these or something else that you feel right doing? Where does your body ask you to give it this gentle supportive touch right now? And we'll just take another minute or so. If you want to return one more time to that inquiry what do I need right now? Maybe supportive touch is it, but maybe something different or something else also comes bubbling through. So then just letting your hands come to rest. Returning to the sense of your body wherever you are seated or standing right now. And if your eyes have been closed, slowly blinking them open and focusing again on the screen and seeing the friendly faces here. Yeah, wonderful. So welcome back. Thank you, thank you for trying that out to whatever extent you did. Again, my great pleasure to be with you. So I'm grateful to UCSF for inviting me and very grateful to each of you for showing up and grateful and hello to those of you who are watching this video after uh, November 30th. Uh, grateful for your presence also. Uh, just a reminder about uh, Zen Caregiving Project, my home base, where we have classes and webinars and meditations, both guided recorded meditations available for free, uh, live weekly meditation, also by donation or for free. You can join us on Tuesday mornings. So please check out our website. I'd love to see you there at any time. My email is here. I'm happy to hear from you directly if I can be of any support now or in the future. And then if anyone enjoys social media, um, I'm on Instagram and would be happy to connect there as well. And um, I'll just offer a poem and then um, turn it back over to you, Margareta, for the last, last word. So this is uh, poet Donna Ashworth, titled Joy. And she writes, joy does not arrive with a fanfare on a red carpet strewn with the flowers of a perfect life. Joy sneaks in as you pour a cup of coffee 
watching the sun hit your favorite tree just right. And you usher joy away because you are not ready for it. Your house is not as it must be for such a distinguished guest. But joy cares nothing for your messy home or your bank balance or your waistline, you see. Joy is supposed to slither through the cracks of your imperfect life. That's how joy works. You cannot invite her. You can only be ready when she appears and hug her with meaning because in this very moment, joy chose you. That's Donna Ashworth. So thank you so much. Thank you, Margareta and UCSF. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mary. That was that was beautiful. Um, and thank you each for coming today and sharing so generously. Um, and my team, I, we all got a little good feeling um, after today. So, um, yes, I, thanks for being here. And happy Caregivers Month. And uh, thanks for all that you do for your loved ones or you have in the past going forward.